Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's. Hopefully you have your booklet here. Um, we have run out of these, so if you are a couple or a family, if you don't mind sharing. Um, so just kind of wave your hand if you have a... Don't give them all away. <laughs> how many people need them? How, how about if I say, okay, yeah, well, so all right, bring them on. You can even have mine too, so let's pass it on. Thank you. Let's share the wealth here. Right now, with a lot of the readings that we have in our church, the liturgical calendar, um, it, it has us really focusing on sin. And so, yeah, but we, we talk about sin. Let me move this thing here. I'm going to stand up here. Good. Now I can see everyone in the back. So we're talking about sin not because we want to learn more and more about sin. Obviously not. We want to know about sin, but only in as much as it helps us know how it is that we fall off the path that leads to paradise, to use Dante's term, so that we won't. That, that, that's the whole point. And in the whole context of the divine comedy, yes, we learn plenty about vice, but please, we learn even more about virtue and how to maintain this road, this um, path of virtue that leads to, to righteousness, that leads to holiness. So uh, welcome to the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's. We have about 170 people who are joining us by means of the webcam as well, so welcome to you as well. Um, regain or renew hope, all you who enter here. This is the house of God and the gate of heaven. The divine comedy can be really looked at from so many different points of view, and we're going to try to, to look at it from several. Obviously, we can look at it from a, um, a very historical point of view, taking a look at the divine comedy in its 14th century context, which Dr. Cheryl White will be doing a lot of. We can take a look at it from a very philosophical point of view, theological point of view, which of course I will be taking care of, and also in an artistic, musical point of view. Why? Well, because throughout the divine comedy, we hear music. Well, there's no music in hell. There's no music in hell, and we are going to talk about that. Um, well, I, well, I will say this. There is one song that is chanted in hell, at the pit of hell, that icy uh, pit of hell where Satan himself is. It's the Vexila Regis, the banners of, of the king, the regal banners, but it's really being sung by those minions of Satan as a parody, because obviously the king, the king, is Jesus Christ himself. So, I mean, th they cannot be singing this for real. This is a complete, total parody. So you have me, you have Dr. Cheryl Wye from LSUS, and also the director of religious education here at the cathedral. But we also have Aaron Wilson, our director of sacred music, and together with a number of our choir members who are an important part of this evening's presentation as well. So yes, we hear about disordered love in, in hell, and all of the disharmony that therefore occurs there, the noise that takes place there. And then all of a sudden when Dante and his, divine, his guide, Virgil, um, get to purgatory, now all of a sudden it's a beautiful harmony. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit as well. So, When you came into the cathedral, you probably noticed that the, uh, our organist was playing an improv of Adorate Devote. So that, that is a hymn that was written by 
uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, he died in the year 1274, 1274. So that would have meant that Dante was about nine years of age, all right? He would have been a nine-year-old boy. He would have heard this because, um, because it was, became a, a super famous, uh, popular uh, devotional chant at the time, very Eucharistic in its theme. So he would have heard that. And so, um, uh, Aaron, if you please just play that first line, the Adoro Te Devote. I believe everyone is familiar with that particular melody, and, and not just in the Catholic Church uh, world. This is a, a, a beautiful melody. And the sixth verse of that particular hymn, it's, O, o pihe pelicane, Jesu domine, O pious pelican, Jesus the Lord. O pious pelican. I said it was a Eucharistic hymn. My goodness, why would they be singing about a pelican? Well, back then in the 13th and 14th centuries, they thought that the mother pelican would literally cut into her chest and bleed so that her chicks would be able to have some type of nourishment if she had nothing to feed those young chicks. And so therefore, they saw this as a, an image of Jesus Christ. They saw this as an image of, of Jesus, how he shed his blood on the cross so that we may have life. Now, th though this may not be particularly accurate, the image is certainly very true. And I mention that because of what you even see right here on this altar, a pelican, O pious pelican. This isn't here because it's our state bird. You know, th th this is here because it's a, it's a Eucharistic symbol, panis vitae, bread of life. And there's so many other beautiful things that, that we have in our church. So, for example, I mentioned a moment ago, um, this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. So for those of you who can see right here, this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. Those two angels are holding that banner. We're surrounded by great beauty, and you really have to have a key to understand that which we are surrounded by. And so, if you don't know anything about it, don't worry, I'm not going to give you a lecture on the stained glass windows of the Cathedral Parish, although I could. You have to, you have to know that these three major windows tell you about the life of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And you have to know where to start. And then we find out that we actually start right here, and there's Ignatius, and he's in a battle, and there's a cannonball. And then you go down here, and he has to go home and convalesce, and he reads the life of Christ, then he goes home, then he goes to confession, then he puts his sword at the altar of Mary, then he starts feeding the poor, and then you go around to the choir loft, and it tells you more and more, and then you go over here, and it continues to tell you a story about his going to see the Pope and sending St. Francis Xavier away um, to India, et cetera, et cetera. So I've, di I've just given you a little bit, but now if you've never known anything about the stained glass windows, you can be, okay, now, now I can stand in front of here. I, I can now read these windows. And I, if, if I have a really good understanding of the windows there, the joyful mysteries of the rosary, the sorrowful mysteries, of course, behind me, the, the glorious mysteries. Right there, I just gave you a little bit of an interpretive key with regards to the stained glass windows that you find here. Well, we want to give you an interpretive key with regards to the Divine Comedy. And if we have a better understanding of how it is we can read the Divine Comedy, then our appreciation of it will be so much uh, the better, whether we're reading it from a historical point of view, from the point of view of art and beauty or theology, as I said. It's kind of like, you know, you, you take up any of these classics. I'm sure many of you have read the Confessions of St. Augustine, and if you do so, well, we're in the early fifth century. Yes, we can get a, a kind of sort of a glimpse of the history of the time. 
or you can read it from a purely philosophical point of view, and then you read it again with your, with your mind, your heart set on theology, now it's, it's like a totally different story. And so, again, all of that by means of an introduction to what I hope will be for you an informative evening and also something that, ho that will ho hopefully also stir your heart. And so I wish to invite now Dr. Cheryl White as we will get quickly to the, the first main part of our talk. Thank you, Father. Can everyone hear me okay? Am I on? Good, great, thank you. So I want to use an introductory term um, just to begin my portion of this talk, an introductory term that we use in academia called the canon of Western literature. So for those of you that are familiar with the word canon, C-A-N-O-N, we're talking about a word that means a rule to measure by. So canon of Western literature means there's an expectation that these are the works that the average educated person would know or would have had some exposure to, right? Those works, those literary works that have such great historical significance that everybody needs to know them. And for instance, you might find, not you might, you would find in the canon of Western literature such works as the Homeric epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey by Homer. Everybody's heard of those? My students better be nodding their heads. Right? The Homeric epics. You would find Beowulf, for instance. Um, obviously the works of men like Chaucer and Shakespeare. And certainly the work that we're going to be talking about and exploring tonight, uh, the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Dante, so important that we know him by his, only by his first name. Right? We just call him Dante, kind of like Elvis. Everybody knows him by his first name only. So important to, is he to the canon of Western literature that we continue to see significant cultural impacts from this work to this day. For instance, did you know that Dante has a very strong social media presence in 2022? Did you know that he has a Facebook page with thousands of followers? He has a Twitter feed. He has an Instagram. I don't believe he has a Snapchat, but he does, he does have a lot of followers on social media to this day, 701 years after his death. Dante has a video game, a very popular one. When I surveyed my students about this, nearly every hand in the room went up. They all knew you can play it on Xbox Live, you can play it on your PC. It's, it, I think it even has like a, um, several other versions, but probably a Mac version as well, Dante's Inferno. Dante has a series of puzzles you can purchase in retail outlets called Dante's, are you ready? Dante's Infernal Puzzles, because they are so difficult to put together. Dante also has a Lego set. If you'd like to build the nine circles of hell using a Lego set, such a thing has been created. I've never been able to buy one because you, you can find them on eBay sometimes, but they're incredibly expensive. Um, so, so yeah, many people still journey with Dante through Inferno, that's obviously the most popular one, Purgatory into Paradise. There are many, many, many good English translations of this work available. It is wildly popular, as I said, even today, as a reference in our popular culture. Actually, I think it might be sort of universal that many of us, when we find ourselves in distress or an unpleasant or uncomfortable situation, we are wont to say, I must be in one of the nine circles of hell. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever used that expression? Sure. It is so much a part of our culture today. His physical scheme of hell, by the way, this is true of, of Mount Purgatory too, which Father Peter will be talking a little bit about, his physical scheme of hell is really the first time in history that someone gave visible structure to the concept of hell. And it's very vivid. It's very descriptive. It's very graphic. I think this is why that is the most popular of the three books, is because it's the one that involves the most graphic torture, 
right? The most visible, uh, sort of visceral kind of scenes, brutal scenes of, of what happens to these tortured souls. And actually, some of us who know the history are, are a little bit, uh, find it a little bit humorous of some of the people he has placed in Inferno, uh, actual historical figures. So this, um, this whole idea of comedy, let's, let's talk about that right now. Because, because this work, if you spoke about it from no other perspective, let's leave the theological out of it for a moment. If you even leave the um, sort of the literary aspects out of it, which are, which are a whole other dimension of it, if you just looked at its impact in history, what you see is, first of all, it is so bold and so innovative, revolutionary is not too big of a word to use for this, in the age in which he lives, the license that he takes, the very bold choices he makes in this work really make it, continue to make it remarkable. Many people, and I think myself included, would, would agree with this. Uh, one of the fields that I teach actually is late medieval and early, uh, early modern. So he, he really is at the very edge of this. Uh, some, his, some scholars argue that he really ushers in the entire modern age. He sets the stage for the entire Italian Renaissance uh, that is coming, some would argue. So what is this work, Divine Comedy? Is it a comedy? Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Actually, some of it's quite humorous, I think, but that might not be too much of an accurate commentary. Some of it I do find funny. But there are so many different secular and philosophical and religious interpretations of this work. It is beyond the scope of a session like this to really explore all of those. And I know that Father Peter is going to be uh, touching upon the theological, so I'm leaving that profound topic in, 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 in his realm, in his hands. So I'm going to place it in some historical context for you. It's the early 14th century. I want to set the stage for you. When Dante began this work, many people believe that he began the work as early as 1300. Um, I think there is some consensus that Inferno was well underway by 1302. And at this point in time, Italy is suffering from a severe lack of unity. Okay? It was the age of the rival city-states, where you have despots who are ruling. Now, when I say the word despot, I'm talking about, the word literally comes from a Greek word, which means master, and it implies somebody who has come to political power by less than legitimate means, if you know what I mean. Okay? By less than legitimate means. So you have these great city-states of Italy that are all competing with one another, all being ruled by these different political factions. And it was a time of great conflict between church and state over the issue of spiritual authority versus secular authority and who held which and to what degree. It's really a big drama, huge drama. Interestingly, to sort of bring this down to a, to a local level, which I think is kind of important to understanding Dante, no one would have identified himself as Italian. Even though everyone spoke a common language, you wouldn't have identified yourself that way. There's no sense of an Italian identity, right? If you were out and about and someone asked you that you were traveling and someone asked you where you were from, it didn't matter where in Europe you were, you would answer, I'm Neapolitan, I'm Milanese. I'm Venetian, I'm Florentine. You see, there's not that idea of belonging to something greater than the city-state. That was the biggest identity. So what that means for Dante is he gets caught up in a very complex web of events that we could come back and do a six-hour lecture on, okay, all the political factions. But he gets caught up in the middle of that. Very unfortunately, he's a very popular poet he is known as a philosopher, well known in his city of Florence, but he ends up being exiled in 1302. And so the bulk of this work was written outside of Florence. He was exiled to Ravenna, which is where he died and is buried, um, not even in his beloved Florence. So he mourns Florence. He mourns Florence. Naturally, he would. It was his home city. Um, I've often used this example with my students that we have an identity, I think the reason it's hard for us to get our heads around this is that we have a multi-layered identity, don't we? 
If you leave Shreveport today and travel to New Orleans and somebody asks you where you're from, what do you say? Anybody? You're from Shreveport. If you leave Louisiana and travel to New York State and somebody asks you where you're from, what do you say? Louisiana. If you leave the United States and you travel to France and somebody asks you where you're from, what do you answer? Do you see what you just did? You have a multi-layered identity. You're a complex identity. Dante would not have known that. Dante was a Florentine, and he loves Florence. And that is crucial to understanding at least one of the interpretations uh, that, that is commonly put forward about him. Okay, so let's talk about then um, this, this, this complicated age and how he gets kicked out of Florence. Um, when he was given the opportunity to return, by the way, he refused because he was going to have to pay a fine. And he was offended by that. So he would not return, and he did not, therefore, die in his beloved Florence. So how many of you know that he composed anything other than Divine Comedy? Anybody know that? Do you know that there are at least, okay, one hand went up over there, yay. You must be a literature major. Yeah, there you go, I can spot him a mile away. Eight other major poetic works that he is known to have written, but nobody remembers the name of any of them except Divine Comedy. What Dante did in this work is really, as I said, very revolutionary. First of all, it's not a comedy because it's funny. It's a comedy because it's written in the Italian language. He dared to write in the vernacular language. In an age when only scholarly, all scholarly works were written only in Latin, he dared to write something in the language of the common people. Not only that, he does something else very bold and daring. He places himself in his own story, in his own story, not just any story. <laughs> it's a divine story. It's a story of his own journey through nine layers of hell, ascending Mount Purgatory into paradise. And along the way, of course, in his own journey, what does he do? He picks up a guide from antiquity, a pagan poet by the name of Virgil, who'd written some epic poetry himself. Virgil is in the first circle of hell, which is that hell, that circle which is reserved for virtuous pagans. And somehow that granted him access to all the other layers of hell and purgatory as well, because he accompanies Dante on his journey. Virgil can go no further than purgatory, however. So he picks up another guide, right? He picks up a second guide in purgatory, um, Sordello of Mantua, who was another poet, but, an, but a more recent one, 13th century poet, accompanies him through the rest of purgatory. Then he gets to paradise where he meets up with his beloved Beatrice, who then hands him off to a fourth guide, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. So he puts himself in this story with all of these real historical figures and quite the cast of characters. In fact, he placed a recent pope, Boniface VIII, in hell. <laughs> Not surprising, I guess, for medieval popes, right? He places another medieval pope in hell, Nicholas III, but Nicholas III was dead. <laughs> Nicholas III died in 1290. Boniface VIII was still alive at the time that Dante is writing. Um, so that's, that's also interesting. He places Saint Celestine V, a pope who had resigned from office after only five months. He places him in hell. And you know why? Because it was his abandoning of the papal office that ushered in the age of Boniface VIII. So he has all of this great historical commentary. He has a truly encyclopedic knowledge of the age, and it can be read in many ways as a history, which is, I guess, part of the appeal that it has for me. So as Father Peter alluded to, in Dante's scheme of hell, at the very bottom what you find is a lake of ice. Satan is bound in a lake of ice, and he has three mouths. Dante describes him as having three mouths. And in each of his mouths, there is a different traitor of history. Traitor, T-R-A-I-T-O-R, -T traitor. Because for Dante, that represented the worst possible sin was to betray a friend. So the three people he depicts there, real historical figures, for instance, he places in, in Satan's mouth Brutus and Cassius, 
the assassins of Julius Caesar and Judas Iscariot. And as, as Father mentioned, we, you don't ever hear anybody talking about um, hell being a place of ice, do we? You never hear that. I mean, he was telling me earlier, you don't ever hear anybody say um, hell is melting or when hell melts. It's always when hell freezes over, right? So we have that, that very unusual depiction. I know that Father's going to be touching upon purgatory and paradise, so I'm not going to go in too much to his exploration of that at all. But I do want to tell you this, this, this really, I think, important interpretation, um, or th two couple of different interpretations that people have of Dante, besides this being a theological work. Because, you know, many people say this is the journey of Dante's soul. Okay. Some people say this is the journey of any Christian soul. It's an added interpretation. An interesting secular interpretation, completely secular, academic interpretation, is that he's writing a love letter to Florence. And he's telling Florence, these are all of your deadly sins. <laughs> so when he reaches paradise and he reaches, he sees the beatific vision, the beatific vision in this interpretation is Florence restored to its splendor, to its glory, before all of this political conflict ever happened. So he offers so much commentary on the political events of the day, it really is a boon for almost every single discipline to study. From a literary perspective, I can tell you it's literally a song. It's literally a song. It is written in cantos musical that are, that are verses that are symmetrical, and in terms of meter, they are perfection. They're perfection. The three books themselves are all symmetrical in the way that they are organized. So that's a whole other field that people study about Dante's uh, divine comedy. So there's so many reasons that it continues to be important. It continues to be studied today. Um, the bold use of the Italian language in placing himself in the story uh, where he directs all the action the appearance of a poet from classical antiquity in a time when Italy is entering a great period of renaissance, remembering that they were once the greatest empire in the history of the world. They're reviving people from classical antiquity to be on this journey uh, with him. The use of all of that perfect meter and structure. So I want to leave you with this. The journey of a soul, Dante's, encountering sin and heavenly virtue um, can obviously be applied to any life. And that is the most common theological sort of, uh, at least the initial extrapolation of that is, is, is to apply it to the journey of every Christian soul. The first musical selection that you're getting ready to hear, um, this is actually, I think, quite moving. Salve Regina, as it's called, and actually, if you looked in your book, and my apologies for having no page numbers, that's my fault. I better not hear a single student say that I violated Chicago Manual of Style by not putting a page number. But if you, if you flip to the page, actually, I think it's maybe one, two, three, four, five. If you flip to the page where everybody, can everybody find Venus? the last purgatory panel. On the back of that is the Salve Regina, okay? So I'm going to read you the portion in English, just a little bit of it. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. Hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. That was composed in the early 13th century in a very famous abbey in France, a Cluny uh, Abbey. This, um, this, this, this whole notion of Valley of Tears is so poignantly referenced in a verse in Purgatory. This is the scene. Virgil and Dante are climbing Mount Purgatory, and the soul in its ascent up Mount Purgatory cannot travel in darkness. It cannot travel at night. 
The reason for that is that the soul, Dante tells us, the soul loses its will in darkness. So they only travel in the light. And they stop at night to rest in this pleasant valley. Pleasant meadow is how Dante describes it. Then he goes on to say it is a valley of tears. It's a valley of tears. Because all of these souls are also seeking shelter for the night on their journey, which they hope will end soon, as they ascend Mount Purgatory. So, Aaron, I'm giving it to you. No doubt, as people were reading the Divine Comedy and getting to these different uh, uh, melodies and, and references, uh, inferences with regards to psalms and, and music, they were probably reading and maybe even humming this melody that was very familiar in the 14th century. There are three Marian antiphons that are referred to in in the Divine Comedy, this being one of them, and then the, the Hail Mary, Ave Maria, and then the Regina Celi, the Regina Celi, Queen of Heaven, uh, we hear when we are in paradise. That's how we will end our time together this evening with that particular one. But, but again, you, you hear the notion of poor banished children of Eve, we who are part of this exile, Remember the communion of saints as we understand it. The communion of saints, it's we here on earth, purgatory and heaven. That's the communion of saints. We're just on the side where we're part of the poor banished children of Eve. We're still in our exile. Why? Well, we're not, we have not yet made it to our heavenly home. And we still have quite a journey uh, to make in order to get there. Now, on the very first page, that, that, that very, the blue poster, uh, th that you see there, um, I had someone say to me, oh, it says heaven and hell, virtue and vice. You all obviously forgot about purgatory. And I'm like, no, 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 we didn't forget about purgatory. Heaven and hell, that these are the things that remain, that last forever and ever and ever. Purgatory, yes, of course we believe there's a purgatory. But when it's all said and done, purgatory is going to be empty. And those who are in purgatory, there's only one way out, up. 
if you want to use uh, th that direction. Now, there's only one way out, getting to heaven. But it's a long, arduous journey. And the people back then would have taken the notion of, of purgatory 100% for granted. They, they would have known it to be, a, to be a place where people went in order to be purged, as that word suggests, to be purified, to have one's soul prepared to meet their, uh, their maker. And so in one place in, in Scripture that, of course, many of them would have, have known and taken for granted uh, revelations, nothing unclean will enter the presence of God in heaven. Nothing unclean will enter the presence of God in heaven. Well, obviously, we're not talking about a body being dirty. We're talking in terms of a soul and, and the, the dirt, the stain that must somehow be purified. And of course, then, as we understand today, well, this is a soul that, that has died, but there's still a, a person who has died in the friendship of Christ, but is not yet perfectly purified. In fact, that's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. That's paragraph 1030 for those of you uh, keeping track. Um, but but that, that was the understanding that you die in the friendship of Christ. In other words, you're not destined to hell. You haven't chosen hell. You've chosen Christ, but there's still some purging. And as I tell even some of the kids right next door at our school, you know, if, if you're going to meet God, if, you're, if the Pope were going to come here, someone very important coming to your house, you know, your parents are going to make sure that you go and you clean up and you put on the best clothes, you know, I mean, just the whole notion of purifying, this is something that is something that we would want to do before we get into the presence of God. We would want ourselves to be purified. Uh, St. Paul says that when we are judged, each person will be tried. And what happens if the righteous man's work fails? He will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through fire. This is 1 Corinthians 3.15. So, so the, what is St. Paul speaking about except uh, what we would call this understanding of purgatory, which is, again, the people in Florence in the 13, early 1300s would have taken absolutely for granted. And so this arduous journey of a person, a soul, that must go through this uh, purging. So what we've, we've made our way through the, the nine descending levels of hell all the way to the icy bottom where Satan is. And as Dr. White said, you know, at, at each one of those levels, there's a, a meticulously organized torture chamber. I mean, th th that's what it is, a torture chamber. This is not a purification chamber. This is a torture chamber where people will exist for all eternity. Now, when we get to purgatory, there's the purging. There's a sense of, yes, trial. It's arduous, this journey but it's meant for a purpose, and we're going to leave it behind in order to make our way up to the earthly paradise, uh, a launching pad, if you will, um, to paradise itself. And so when we look at purgatory, there's also nine levels, but it's, the first two are really anti-chambers, if you want to put uh, um, pre-purgatory levels. Uh, until you actually get to the gate of St. Peter. And then you have the seven levels uh, of purgatory. Now, I, I wish to spend a little bit more time right here in purgatory for everyone's sake, my sa myself included. So here we are. We're in purgatory. The foundational sin of them all is pride. Now, this is what many people would have started off with their, uh, the first of the seven deadly sins. St. Thomas Aquinas said, pride permeates them all, is the queen of all vice, and he called the first of the seven deadly sins vanity. 
Dante and, and many others said, no, the, the, the first of the seven deadly sins is pride, envy, anger, sloth, greed, gluttony, lust. And the order is very specific. It starts from the most spiritual, pride, goes all the way to the most physical, lust. And in each one of these particular levels, uh, the, the, the penitent soul atoning for the sins that he or she has committed uh, on earth has to undergo some kind of purging, something, some trial. So for the proud, those who are filled with this uh, 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 capital sin, the deadly sin of, of pride, Dante has them carrying heavy boulders for many of you, I'm sure you know all the different remedies, as it were, for at each one of these levels, but heavy boulders, why? Instead of the, the proud, the self-centered, the one who has, okay, the attention is on me, it's all about me, I'm the center of the universe, everyone exists because of me, forgetful of their role that God has given them in life, Instead, they're carrying the, the, these boulders, heavy boulders that, that really force them to look to the ground as they're making their way up to the next level. They're looking to the ground, to the humus, humus, which means dirt. I didn't say hummus, you know, I like hummus. Humus, the, the, the dirt, the ground, I mean, why? Well. Humus, we get the word humility. The antidote to the capital sin of pride is humility. We need humility. And then it goes on further to explain that Mary is our model. We have Mary throughout. <laughs> you can't read uh, the Divine Comedy without finding out more and more about uh, the mother of Jesus. Because she said perfectly, thy will be done. I'm just the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your will, with absolute, complete, total perfection. And so therefore, she is a, a model th that we will see at each of the levels. It's a reminder to us that we can always go to Mary and any of the saints, even in purgatory, seeking purification seeking their intercession, somehow helping us. We, we, we get our help from one another, encouragement from one another as we're here in life, but we can also do so by calling upon the saints. The communion of saints exists on earth, purgatory in heaven, so even in purgatory there can be the intercession of Mary and the saints. And indeed, they do call upon her. In fact, at, at numerous times, you'll hear the Ave Maria. Sometimes the penitent is just chanting it in the background. And they're saying, pray for, uh, pray for us sinners, pray for me, a sinner, now and at the hour of our death. Those are the two most important moments, by the way, of our lives. Now, not yesterday, now and at the hour of our death. That's when we want Mary praying for us. Now, obviously, we're, we're praying for a good death, happy death here. But even in the context of purgatory, we can say, I want to leave this valley of tears, this exile behind, and please, Mary, assist. And so th then we get to the next level, envy. a stepsister, really, of, of pride, envy. Those who have been so envious. It's one thing to, to, um, to want something, a thing of another. That's more jealousy than anything. But envy here really means that it's to the degree that you also want the bad for the other person. It's somehow where you think that if that person has the piece of the pie, that means I can't have the piece of the pie, and the piece of the pie somehow is some finite, limited amount, 
And that's just not the case. God's mercy is infinite, completely, totally infinite. His grace is infinite. So if someone else has a piece of that infinity, well, our disposition must be one of admiration. So as soon as you start to feel, oh, I'm getting a little envious of other people, stop, say, I need to admire the God-given gifts that that person has been given, as I can admire the, the gifts that I have received. Admiration. And, and it's quite, I think, it's great uh, how Dante sees the, the punishment of those who have, who have been so envious. Do you recall what it was? Sewing the eyelids shut of those people who have been looking with envy at other people, now their eyelids are shut. They can't, they, they can't look in an envious way. They have to be reflective of that which God has given them as they are pursuing holiness, even in the context of purgatory. This is meant for us here on earth. We're not going to sew our eyes shut, but we certainly know that with our eyes we can, we can see that which we, instead of admire, we are envying, and we absolutely must not do that. I mentioned uh, the Hail Mary. Before we get to the other five, uh, we're going to hear uh, the Hail Mary and the chant that the people would have heard in the 14th century. So, and as, as you listen to it, don't just listen to it, pray it. This comes from the first part of, of the Gospel of Luke. So l let's listen, Hail Mary, full of grace, and as we pray for ourselves now and at the hour of our deaths. That version of the chant is older than the one that we're accustomed to hearing, a very beautiful chant, obviously. But Ave Maria is mentioned so many times in the Divine Comedy. Again, I can't help but think that as they were going along and someone was reading it, they have this little chant in the background. Or maybe they're now at church and they hear the chant and they're reminded of what they, they had just read in the Divine Comedy and how it is that Mary can intercede for us now and at the hour of our death. Before I uh, really kind of sort of continue, I, I want to mention something that I mentioned at, in the homilies of this past weekend um, about a Mr. Reed Hoffman. Everyone knows Reed Hoffman, right? Well, if you're, if you're here at the Mass, you do. Uh, he was uh, one of the co-founders of the social media uh, LinkedIn. Okay, you probably know LinkedIn. But he, he wrote this article for the Wall Street Journal. 
in which he talked about all of social media and part of the reason for the success of social media is that they all tapped into one of the seven deadly sins. That's part of the reason for the success of social media. Now, tell me if any of this sounds uh, true to you. He says, um, social uh, networks do their best when they tap into one of the seven deadly sins, and then he gives the example of the sin, and then he, he, he says uh, which social network it refers to. Lust, tender, right? <laughs> Envy, we just talked about it, Pinterest. Now, I've been to Pinterest, okay? I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's bad. You know, we get good ideas, but sometimes it's with super envious eyes. Look what someone else has, and I've got to have that too. Now it can get quite um, extreme. Greed, LinkedIn. And then th this is the guy who was the co-founder of, of it, saying that this is what they're intentionally trying to do, tap into the, the deadly sin of greed in order to get more and more people to... Uh, to be part of that. Gluttony, Instagram, pride, vanity, Facebook, anger, wrath, Twitter, sloth, Netflix. <laughs> I guess I'm guilty there too. Someone asked me after Mass, well, what about YouTube? Well, you know, I mean, he, he didn't write anything about YouTube, but I think YouTube could probably you know, depending upon why you're going there, it can be super great because I, you know, when I don't know what to do and, and how to fix something, I go to YouTube, how do I fix whatever? Uh, so it can be great. But the, his whole point is that sin is alluring, it's attractive, and if we can tap into it, then we're going to get people to somehow participate in it and keep them there. So. Again, the more we understand about sin, hopefully, please, dear Lord, the more we're going to stay away from sin. And that was also Dante's point about this journey. The more that our eyes could be open to how hideous sin is, the more we're going to stay away from it. In fact, he, he basically says in as many words, if, if we could see if, if the heinous nature of sin were readily apparent, no one would sin. If they clearly understood how it, it broke our relationship with God, no one would sin. Obviously, it's not readily apparent, so that's why we need to, to be part of this journey. So I said pride, envy, anger, sloth, greed, gluttony, lust. Pride, envy, anger. Now, the, the, this isn't like anger, like, you know, well, I, I, I got angry at my child because he or she didn't uh, obey um, and really did something wrong. I mean, th there's times that we should be frustrated. There's times that, that we should be angry. Jesus was angry. Remember the scene with the money changers? He made a whip of cords, stop making my father's house a, a den of thieves. There's righteous anger. But then there's the anger out of which we know we sin and we choose wrong, um, usually because it's based on something I'm not able to get. And the anger, uh, the, the, the remedy for anger that, that Dante uh, proposes is smoke, this acrid smoke. There, there they are, they're on that particular level and they're <coughs> They, they, they can't talk, they can't really see clearly, they're trying to make their way, they're, they're inhaling this, this is hurting, and it, it keeps them from putting their attention and their um, uh, anger, their hatred, their whatever it may be, onto another person. They're, they're so consumed with what it is that they are doing and, and, and undergoing for that purging at that moment. So anger wrath, the opposite of it, the antidote for it is patience, is forgiveness. Because some, oftentimes people do wrong us, and it, 
And then that moment we want to react in anger, if we were able to react very quickly with forgiveness. I mean, that, that's, that's, we need to rewire the buttons. I think Dante would probably say something about that today if he were writing. Rewire these buttons that, that are automatically pushed in us that when someone does this, we react this way. Well, now when someone does something, when someone cuts you off as you're driving home from church and they boom, get right in front of you and you throw out a choice word, hopefully it's a word of blessing, right? That's what it needs to be from this day uh, forward. You know, and, and seriously, we have to retrain ourselves, as it were, so that we don't fall into this deadly sin of anger. And when we talk about deadly sin, we mean deadly because it takes the life of God away from us. And it's deadly because we believe that when we die, if we die with a deadly sin on our souls, it is deadly, eternally deadly. So it, it, it's, it's something, again, that I think that the people in the early 14th century would have had a much greater appreciation of and fear of, of committing. So pride, envy, anger, sloth. Sloth. It's not just, it's not just the leisure. Leisure is good. It's supposed to be um, beneficial. It's supposed to be recreative, recreation. Uh, uh, but we all know that there are times in which we take sloth way too far, sloth especially in, with regards to spiritual things. That's how Thomas Aquinas refers to it, sloth with regards to, so, so we might be slothful in prayer. Let's just, we're in a church, so we're, uh, we're and, and we, we can't even muster up the energy to, to, to pray. And uh, it's okay, I'll, I'm, I'll get around to it, you know. Another uh, Sunday, it's a day of the Lord, I understand, but um, mm, yeah, no, you know. In fact, some of the, some of the uh, theologians say that sloth is actually the worst of all the deadly sins. Dante doesn't say that. He puts it right there in the middle. Um, many people say it's the worst of the seven deadly sins because, because you just can't get out of sloth. You know, when, you, when out of pride, you, you, you fall face forward and you are, you know, pride guns before the fall, right? And then boom, you hit, you hit, and we can bounce back. It's like, okay. There's that sense of humiliation, and I, I, I've got it, I see what happened, I'm back. Whereas sloth is like, okay, we, we can't really see ourselves out of this. I mean, it's, so Dante, he, he says to the people, he, he has them, basically I'll call it like a treadmill. <laughs> it's like they're on a treadmill, uh, just moving constantly without really getting anywhere. There's that perpetual motion because they weren't in motion on earth. In fact, he has the people on that particular level recall Mary going to visit her kinswoman, Elizabeth, and she proceeded to the hill country in haste, in haste. That's where we need to be. Everything we're doing for, the, for our own spiritual good is in haste. You know, I mean, not, not hastily, like in a negative sense, but we're about what it is God has given us to do. Mary was about her role at all times. So if, if someone says, oh, you know, I, that, that's the deadly sin, because Satan uses one of them on each one of us, you know, and okay, that's mine. All right, Mary, please help me in haste. In help. The, the, think of the, think in, in terms of the, the antidote being zeal. 
zeal. So if, if sloth is the one that you really find yourself that level on, then, then I would say get a little sticky note, all right? When you get home, get a sticky note. If you remember, I mean, it's sloth, right? So I mean, you might not pick it up and uh, it's four letters, write down four letters. Zeal, put it in the right order. Zeal, and just put that sticky note on your, your bathroom mirror. You know, look at it, oh, that's right, zeal, okay. Give me, give me that zeal, give me that, that drive, that energy to be able to, to, to continue to move forward. I need to be diligent. I need to be about that which God has given me to do so that I'm not falling into the deadly sin of sloth. All right, why did I spend so much time on sloth? Okay, next one, greed. And, and, and remember that this is a mountain, so it's a mountain that, that keeps going up and until we get to that earthly paradise, and I need to uh, go more quickly. Okay, so uh, greed, avarice, greed. I mean, okay, we all know what greed is, so I don't really have to spend too much time there. But it's not just greed for money. It could be greed for, like, anything. So greed, the opposite of greed would be charity. So if greed is that which you know, okay, that's the one. That's the one that Satan keeps touching. I mean, it hit me on my shoulder, uh, you really want more, more money, more attention, more of this particular thing, or not just more of it, but I want this car, but I, I need it to be the best of the best, the highest of the highest, the, and especially with the, the motivation of, wow, hey, everyone, look at me. I mean, we can see how now it's all about me, 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 me. So the opposite would be generosity. That's what you can write down on, on your sticky note. Generosity, or put it in your, your iPhone. Put zeal in your iPhone, all right? Every day, it's a recurring 7 a.m., zeal, okay, you know? And, and by the way, St. Jose Maria Escrivá would say, you need to set an alarm clock every day and abide by it. You know, he, he was not a fan of snooze. All right? So that, that gets back to sloth. Um, but in other words, do it. Get up. St. John Berkman's, what would he do when he would wake up? He'd wake up, stand up, make the sign of the cross, put on his cassock, kiss his cassock out of gratitude for having been called to the priesthood. Boom, and he would get about his day. Okay, gluttony, gluttony. Again, everyone, I think, always thinks in terms of gluttony with regards to food, with regards to drink. But gluttony, I mean, um, we can be gluttonous in so many different ways. Um, uh, the, the type of food that we have to have, the, the type of clothing that we must have. Um, um, we can look at our closets and see if we fall into the sin of gluttony. Um, some people say, and, uh, you know, if you haven't worn something in two years, someone else should be wearing it, you know. Yeah, but I know I might, I might wear it three years from now, you know. Well, okay, th that might, th there's an, an undue attachment to physical things that, um, and we don't want any attachment. I remember uh, reading Hemingway, of all things, Hem Hemingway said, yeah, I give away my, my shirts to prove that. I own them and that they don't own me. Some of the things that we have, you know, they're actually, they actually own us. So, so gluttony, yes, of course, it's talking about food and drink as well. Any, any, anything that is not being properly used in moderation. And so therefore, uh, the, the antidote to gluttony is temperance and you pray for temperance. And if you don't know what temperance is, that doesn't mean, okay, good, I get to remain gluttonous. No, that, that means you, you study what temperance is and how did the saints do it? How did they overcome it? How, did, how were they able to um, uh, be in control of their desires so that their desires weren't in control of them? And usually we have to start with those little small things. Everyone just start with the small things and we can work our way up to the big things. So gluttony, temperance. Um, so how do we overcome this? By some aesthetic 
practices, you know, you know, when it's time for Lent and giving up whatever it is, but maybe we need to be doing something like that throughout the, uh, throughout the year. Oh, um, I, I've, okay. So the greedy, by the way, let me take a step back. The greedy, uh, in Dante's vision, they're made to lay flat down their, their, their eyes looking at the ground, unable to move um, because of their excessive concern for the things of the, of the earth. Um, um, they're in a position of no power before God. They're saying, okay, God, I need for you to have the power over me. And the gluttonous, they're, they're purged by abstaining from food and drink. Um, uh, to sharpen the pains of hunger, the, the gluttons uh, are, uh, the, it's like the, this waterfall is always there. It's there, it's there, but they can't drink. It's always there. And they're made to say, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. So they're opening their mouth not for food or drink, and not even that nice little cool stream that's right there in front of them. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. So there's an appropriate opening of our lips. Okay, uh, lust. Um, in fact, sometimes uh, uh, a lot of people deal with gluttony and lust together. Um, they call it glust. Um, because sometimes a lot of people, they just, uh, if you got one, you got the other. So hopefully that's not the case here. Um, but, but lust, obviously we believe God has a particular plan for our sexuality. And when we do not follow through with God's plan for us with regards to human sexuality and uh, sexual activity within the context of marriage, well then, and even properly within the context of marriage, then we can very easily fall into the sin of lust. Obeying God's design for our sexuality, using this gift as God intended, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think we understand the antidote to be chastity. And I remember, this is about 12, 13 years ago. Um, um, okay, all right, never mind. I mean, we'll be here forever. We'll be here forever, so. Um, now everyone's gonna email me. What were you gonna say? What happened 12, 13 years ago? Anyways, um, so, um, so we pray for chastity. Chastity. Again, if you don't really quite understand what chastity is, that doesn't mean, okay, I'm, I'm not going to look it up and, and find out. And how did the saints do it? How were they able to live chaste lives as single men, as single women, as married men, as married women, as priests, as nuns, as whatever? And pray for chastity. I mean, so I, I have a, a, like, I don't know, eight medals right around my, my neck. and and. And usually, well, when I see it in, in the mirror, you know, and, and if it's Mary right there, I'm, I'm usually very quick to say, Mary, guard my chastity. You know, what are, the, what are the ways that you can cry out for the help of the saints? Um, and if that needs to be the sticky note, if you need to write all seven, great. But hopefully there's this one in particular you write down. Don't write down lust. Write down chastity, write down chastity, and pray for chastity. Um, so um, so the, the lustful are purged with fire. Finally, we hear about fire. Everyone thinks of all of purgatory and certainly all of hell as being filled with fire. Fire in the sense of the, the, that final purification, you know, you, you put some, some metal that you want to, you know, you have gold, but you want to really get it refined and purified, and you need to uh, burn all the impurities out of it. It's in that sense of fire. But you can also think of the fire of passion, the fire of, of lust that, that we're trying to totally um, uh, get rid of. 
Excessive sexual desire misdirects one's love from God. There's the purpose. And once we've gotten there, once we're there at the top, and, and a, lot of, a lot of times people are like, I always thought lust was the worst. You're telling me it's number seven? You know, and, and, and if, if when people come to confession, if the only thing that they can think of is, is with regards to lust, you know, it's like maybe we should have an examination of all seven, a really good examination of our conscience, starting with pride, the foundation of all sin, and go through them. In fact, uh, we have examination of consciences. I should have printed one for everyone. Uh, you can go to the internet, examination of conscience, seven deadly sins, and I promise you it'll, it'll uh, come up for you uh, immediately. I mean, now we're in paradise. <laughs> okay, oh my goodness. Okay. This upcoming weekend, I'm beginning a seven-part series all about the seven deadly sins. And for those of you who are parishioners here, you're going to hear them um, not in the order in which they're presented to us by Dante, but in the order in which we hear the church's readings giving us the theme. So this upcoming weekend, at no point does it mention the word pride, but it will say humble, humility. I think it's in the church's liturgy seven or eight times this upcoming weekend. So that gives me the perfect opportunity to talk about pride because I'm not really talking about pride, I'm talking about humility. And so, so yes, the first of them will be on humility, then envy, and then some of the order uh, uh, is changed based on, on the readings that the church gives us. I mention this because uh, we record all of these. It's going to be placed on, the, on our website, um, and so hopefully you'll be able to get even greater insight related to uh, the sin, but more importantly, the virtue that is the corresponding sin, that, is, that corresponds with that sin. In just a moment, we're going to have our final piece, the Regina Chaley. Uh, and a, a version that many of you maybe have never heard before. Remember, this is what they would have heard in the early 1300s. I do want to uh, acknowledge that our choir is having a, a concert fundraiser coming up. So if you hear about this gala, I really hope many of you would choose to come and support it. Um, many of you certainly know all about St. Padre Pio. Well, his relics are coming here. We now have the relics of Padre Pio coming here to the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's November 14th and 15th. You'll hear more about it. So please be here for that. A year from now, we'll have our 150th anniversary of the yellow fever epidemic here in Shreveport. Um, hopefully everyone here knows about the, the five servants of God. Um, the documentary that we produced uh, uh, did not win the Cannes Film Festival. It got number four. Out of 12,000 uh, documentaries submitted worldwide, ours got fourth place. Not bad. Um, so um, I will say uh, Mark Wahlberg, I think you've heard of him. Did you see Father Stu? Um, and you know a lot of his other stuff. So um, he knows all about uh, our documentary. He saw it. Um, He's read our book, and now he, we're negotiating with him to do a, uh, he wants to do a motion picture about our five servants of God. So would, would that not be incredible? He's going to do an, an, an intro to the, um, to the documentary, a, a trailer that will help people uh, and their understanding. A second book has already been written. There's more and more and more and more uh, th that you will find out about the holiness of these uh, of these five guys, as we like to say, of uh, these uh, servants of God. And so much will be commemorated next year at this time, because it was in the month, the end of the month of August, that the yellow fever uh, epidemic began. 
I do wish to thank you for being here. Sorry I kept you in purgatory so long. Um, I'm sure there are added graces. Um, please stay as we hear the Regina Chaley. Now, th this is what is heard. Queen of, of, of heaven, um, again, referring to Mary, of course, and upon the conclusion of this, uh, that will conclude our evening together. You're more than welcome to remain in prayer. Dr. Cheryl White and I are gonna stay behind to, to help with any questions or hopefully be able to point you in the right direction regarding uh, further studies related to uh, Dante and the Divine Comedy. So prayerfully, let us listen to the Regina Chaley. Go in peace. Thank you for being here.